and welcome to the BLSI Business and Economics uh, Group. My name is Andreas Wasmuth and I'm the convener for Business and Economics at the BLSI. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's topic, which is the importance of supply chains and their fragility. And I'm absolutely delighted to have not just one, but four experts on supply chains and related matters with me today. Uh, two professors and two doctors from the University of Bath, who will, I will ask to introduce themselves as we get into the questions. Um, now, the questions and the conversations will probably last for about 45 minutes to an hour, which leaves about half an hour for Q&A afterwards, in which case I would then ask you to, to unmute yourself and to also uh, start your video screens again. And then we can go and, and have a discussion in terms of uh, the key elements and tenets of supply chains and how important they are currently in the current crisis, but also how important and fragile they may be as we move on in terms of the economic situation over the next six to 12 months. So without further ado, I would like you to introduce you to Jens Röhrig. Uh, again, professor at Bath University. And Jens, maybe we can start by you introducing yourself before we get into the questions. Okay, so yeah, thank you so much, Andreas, for this kind of invitation. And uh, obviously, thanks for inviting all of us here today. Um, so my name is Jens Wurich. I'm a professor of supply chain innovation at the University of Bath School of Management. Um, and I joined the university initially, actually, as an MSc student. Um, I did obviously very much like Bath. Um, and stayed on for my PhD. I then briefly left uh, Bath, uh, moved to Imperial College in London, and then came back in 2011. And uh, since 2011, obviously, my wife and I live uh, in a particular street, which you can see behind me, Great Falcony <laughs> Street, in the very much city centre um, of Bath. Um, so I've taken that picture actually today. So it's a very sunny day, um, and that's what it looks like actually outside, looking outside my window today. Um, so my interest, generally speaking, with regards to research, engagement, um, and various sort of capability development workshops is really around supply chains, the various challenges that um, public and private organizations are facing. And more specifically, and again, we'll um, talk a little bit more um, about this in, in detail as well, is to think about the role that sort of large projects play as well. So large infrastructure projects, the supply chain of those kind of projects, uh, and the impact that has with regards to well, either a particular region or a particular uh, nation as well. Yeah, so in the current situation, you must have been a very busy person uh, in terms of interviews and, and commentary. I mean, maybe, maybe we start, Jens, by actually uh, giving a definition of what a supply chain is. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to not be too academic about it. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it as, as, as simple as possible. So when we talk about supply chains, I guess we really talk about supply networks. So it isn't necessarily just a, a very neat chain where you have a few companies uh, coming together as a chain, but it's a network of different public private organizations coming together, um, individuals as well, information and resources being exchanged uh, for the ultimate good, I guess, for the for the end consumer or end buyer. Um, that might mean uh, a particular outcome, a particular product. So, for example, um, food that you're buying in a supermarket, your car, the IT equipment that we're using here at the moment, uh, all of which is somehow procured, somewhere delivered through uh, some sort of supply chain or supply network. Um, and again, uh, a range of different organizations working together in order to make this happen. And again, hopefully we'll explain and um, explore a little bit more detail today. Uh, what are some of the challenges as well when we talk about um, supply chains? Okay, and, and how complex do these supply chains get? I mean, obviously you can have one supplier and one, one customer. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty short uh, chain, uh, yeah. but you know, maybe you can give people an idea in terms of how complex yeah. they actually get. Yeah, I think things have uh, changed a lot, I have to say, over the last few decades. Um, so if we look back to maybe sort of 100 years ago when you talk about Ford uh, Motor Company, uh, Henry Ford actually, so he was very keen on owning sort of the whole supply chain or the whole supply network. So he basically owned the sheep farm where you had uh, wool that was needed for the seeds, um, a rubber with regards to the tires, all of which was basically owned by one company. So didn't really talk about 
supply chain, but I think you up a little bit. They created large corporation that was responsible for you now. Yeah, can, can you I, hear me? Can everybody hear you? Everybody can hear you, that's fine. Good. So, sorry, well, it must have been my end. Um okay, but well, that's fine. So let's yeah, so I, 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 Yeah, please go ahead, Jim. Well, I think I think the, the, the complexity of the supply chain obviously is important, but uh, maybe you can also say a little bit about the sort of research and the engagement you are doing at Bath University around supply chains. That's all I think. So over, over the long, you have gone longer supply chain, supply networks, you have more organizations really involved. And I think um, as part of my colleagues that obviously here. Um, I'm obviously delighted to, to have three of my uh, very capable colleagues joining me here today, um, but the wider School of Management and particularly the Information and Decisions and Operations Division, um, we really explore a range of different challenges when it comes to the, the com comes about the management of those kind of supply chains. So from uh, risks that may occur to relationships between public and private organizations, values being created in these kind of supply chains. Um, and it very much feels that sort of in crisis situations such as COVID-19, that's really when, I guess, the general public, but also when organizations seem to be much more interested to uh, some of the poss possibilities or things that supply chains can bring about, but also some of the issues that um, if it's poorly managed, then you probably will have some issues with regards to supply chain, which will in the end affect obviously your um, your various customers. Right. Okay. And in terms of in terms of the the current situation with the supply chains, we obviously heard a lot about the the various issues. And I know that mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it was Ronald Rumsfeld, one of Bush's uh, uh, generals, always talked about known unknowns, and clearly. Mm -hmm. There seem to be lots of known unknowns, unknowns in the supply chain currently in terms of supply of PPE and and uh, and household goods and and food. Um, do you want to give some 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 comment on that, in terms of how we can actually sort of uh, deal with some yeah. of the unknowns? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. I was saying there are obviously a range of different classifications when we talk about different risks, crisis situations. Um, I think I, I've, I, from my perspective, argue that when we talk about COVID-19, we talk about uh, no about time that we do hear about pandemics. Um, there are a number of uh, supranational parties, such as the UN, that have warned for Year, if not even a decade or so, about possible pandemics. I think one of the issues for organizations to make a judgment really about how much time, money, and other resources you want to spend in order to plan for those kind of crisis situations. And I think generally when we talk supply chain managers, project managers, um, I think they're all very used to certain crisis situations. So um, if we think about... Um, obviously, Brexit, uh, Brexit and, and some of the issues that we have with regards to supply chain, but also if you think about um, some, some of the other issues that, um, that think about the volcano eruption in 2010 in Iceland, if we think um, about Hurricane Katrina, and some of the other issues that I guess companies, supply chains have to deal with. So they're very. Can everybody still hear me? Yeah, well, maybe maybe we'll wait for Jens to come back in, and uh, why don't we go over and uh, chat to uh, Manush now? Uh, maybe you can unmute yourself. That would be really helpful. And again, Manush, just like uh, we did with um, Jens, maybe you can say a little bit about yourself, your background, what you do at Bath University, and and what you do in terms of uh, uh, supply chain. Uh, hello. Uh, again, uh, thank you for inviting all of us here. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, my name is Menu Sarafan. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Bath and currently a visiting research fellow at the University of Cambridge. 
Um, so obviously I live in Cambridge at the moment, but I was in Bath for four to five years between 2014 and 2019. Um, I love the uh, I love the city, obviously, but uh, I'm here on the short period. Let's see where uh, what the future holds. In terms of the research, I am more broadly interested in issues about related to risk and resilience in supply chain, mm -hmm. uh, which basically means in in the case of events like COVID-19, what can firms do in order to prepare their supply chains uh, to suffer less from events like this? And also what can they do afterwards in order to better bounce back, so to speak? Um, I think Jens is back. I don't know how you want to. Yes, I've, I've just uh, so Jens is coming back in. So hopefully his uh, reception will be will be slightly better. Yeah, Jens. apologies for that. You see, that's not rehearsed, and there's uh, a little bit of a supply chain issue already here. So no, that's no, like no, clearly, and, uh, living in the lovely Great Pulteney Street, uh, you clearly have a Georgian Wi-Fi connection. So definitely, it does sometimes that. feel like that. Yeah. But we'll we'll come back to you in a second. I think uh, Manoush has just uh, introduced herself. I'm going to ask a couple of questions of Manoush. But maybe maybe Jens, you can just finish because I think it ties into where Manoush will come in, which is all about mm -hmm. how companies can uh, build resilience in the supply chain. That's what Manoush will answer. So maybe yep. maybe you can just talk to some of the problems that uh, supply chains have have encountered uh, right now. You know. Mm -hmm the unknowns or the known unknowns before we then yep. discuss the resilience bit with Manoush. Yep. Yeah, I think there are a range of different uh, issues, some of which we have seen obviously as, uh, as customers. So you have the uh, supply chain or supply network, you might quite often will split into sort of the upstream and downstream part um, where you obviously have uh, to deal with issues with regards to your supplier. And there might be issues, for example, with um, suppliers having issues with payments, um, issues with deliveries, and then you obviously have the customer. Um, and again, as we have seen with uh, COVID-19, a, a very changing demand pattern. Um, so people buying different products than from what they would normally buy. Again, all of which will have an impact on your supply chain, all of which will have an impact on an organization trying to handle the various products and services going through your supply chain. Yeah. And then I think last, uh, last but not least, there's also an issue around politics, uh, internal and external to the organization. So one is uh, government obviously talking about the various um, sourcing and location decisions, so issues around reshoring, and I guess uh, we, will, we will talk about this in a bit more detail today as well. So bringing back some of the... Uh, some of the production facility back into um, a country um, where, where your organization is. And then also issues around sort of the internal politics. So how an organization is dealing with the crisis situation yep. and how they are dealing then with smaller local suppliers. So things like payment terms, how, how does a supermarket, for example, work with farmers? How quickly are they being paid? All of which obviously has an impact of how you deal with your crisis situation and how quickly sometimes media will catch on on some of the issues as well. So I think there are a number of different issues, and I'm sure Manoush will talk about some of the sort of solutions, good practice, best practice with regards to addressing some of the issues, and uh, hopefully we'll get into this in a bit more detail today as well. Yeah. Yes, I, I know we're not specifically mentioning the, uh, the B word today, but uh, I'm sure Brexit will, with it, have lots of different supply chain issues that need to be looked at, uh, whether it's in agriculture or elsewhere. And, uh, and clearly, I haven't seen in the chat room the question yet, but I'm sure sourcing PPE from Turkey, uh, that would seem to have been an issue and, and maybe having this stuff uh, within yeah. the UK might actually have been a helpful thing. But let's go to Manoush and, uh, and, uh, and sort of, talk about uh, the resilience in supply chains because obviously you know Jens talked about the the issues around uh, unprecedented demand fluctuating demands uh, international supply chains where things move between countries they've all been affected at different times how how can companies organizations build resilience in their supply chain um, I think it's 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 important to almost take a step back and then explain or understand what do we mean by supply chain resilience. Yeah. Um, 
What uh, when a supply chain is resilient, it basically means as a firm you would be able to adapt quickly to changes in the environment. In the case of COVID-19, we have seen, for example, a sudden rise in product, a sudden rise in demand for products like PPEs, as you mentioned, hand sanitizer. But at the same time, we also experienced a shortage of supply uh, due to many manufacturing plants had to shut down because of the lockdown. So we are seeing sudden changes both at the demand side and then at the supplier uh, side. For a supply chain to become more resilient, there are multiple ways, and I'm gonna focus on some of the main and fundamental ways that supply chains can be restructured in order to become more resilient. So the first issue, which might sound easy, but it might be in practice not very easy to do, is shorten the supply chain. And what do I mean by that is over the past, three decades, there has been an enormous trend towards moving the manufacturing and supplying, purchasing from countries which have a low manufacturing cost or low labor cost. And for example, the countries like China, like India, like Indonesia, Turkey, Mexico, these are the countries which have a low manufacturing and labor cost. And you see many firms have been moved their production or their suppliers all from those countries. This resulted in a very long supply chain. Imagine if your customers are in the UK and your suppliers is, for example, in China. In situations like what we are experiencing at the moment and the customer wants to all of a sudden uh, order two times, three times an order volume of compared to what they usually order, it takes the supplier the minimum of 35 to 40 days to ship your order from where they are located to where the customer is in the UK. That's a very long lead time. That by nature make you more uh, more fragile, less adaptable. Also very slow in responding to the customer's demand. So as a result, what we experience is empty shelves. What the customer sees is empty shelves. The The same issue, the the same long lead time also leads to by nature issues like loss of control and visibility over your suppliers. Mm-hmm. When you have a very long supply chain, by nature, you, you lose some level of control over what is happening at the supplier side. You don't know if there are issues, if there are any shortages there. And by the time you might identify to share to those issues, it might be already too late. So again, you become by far slower in responding to those issues, identifying and finding alternative ways to refill your order. Um, So the uh, uh, long long lead times or the long supply chain is one of the key, let's put it causal factors of uh, more fragile supply chain. Another issue is another way that firms can uh, make sure they are more resilient is to diversify their supply base. If you are supplying all your products from China, or if you are producing all your products from a single supplier located anywhere in the world, if that supplier faces an issue and cannot refill your order, you you cannot refill your order, you cannot refill the shelves for customers. So what needs to be done is for, for firms to have a portfolio of the suppliers located in different locations and also place the order different levels of order to these suppliers. So diversification of the supply base is a key for creating a more resilient supply chain. Hmm. Okay. Now, I think it's interesting, uh, Manoush. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, lots of uh, business people uh, would have been taught the idea of JIT, just in time, you know, secure. And obviously, that that seems to be you know that and diversification into a roster of different suppliers seem to be so two of the issues that need to be addressed uh i believe so so the the special like the issue i i discussed about the long lead times uh so just in time is one of the principles of lean supply chain which by 
by philosophy it basically means reducing waste and trying to reduce the cost uh, to the minimum level and as a result you hold the minimum level of inventory in your supply chain so you don't have a strategic stock that that can basically to, to rely on in situations like COVID-19 it also means you are gonna supply from places that are offering you the lowest cost because that brings the cost down so I think some of these focus over the last three decades have caused supply chains to become more fragile and we have to start rethinking of whether supply chains have to change the thinking behind it if, if, if focus focusing on cost is enough or whether we need to bring other criteria in place when we are designing our supply chain Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about these other criteria. I mean, Manush, what do you think companies need to do to be better prepared for situations like this, but also other potential crises in the future? Um, I think going forward, it's, again, it's very important to shorten the supply chain. So the issues I talk about, the very long supply chain, you need to shorten your supply chain. If that means bringing the suppliers closer to home, it might mean reshoring, bringing the manufacturing back home. It also might mean, you. I appreciate it might be costly for a supply chain to all of a sudden mm -hmm. reshore 100% or supply 100% of their order from countries or places closer to home, but they could diversify. They could have a suppliers which provide 20% of the order which is closer to home. Yeah. And then you have, a, you have a supplier which is further distant and then you can create a portfolio. I think, uh, having a shorter supply chain is very important. The second factor, I think it's important to hold strategic stock where the customer is, closer to where the customer is. It might be costly, but they need to make a trade-off. Yeah. So it's costly because you need to maintain the supply, maintain the inventory, you need to ensure the inventory, but at the same time, if something happens like what we experienced over the past three months, you can rely on that on that inventory and be quicker uh, to reply to the to the changes. The third issue, the third factor, which I think is also the more strategic way of um, resolving the issue, is creating a more collaborative supply chains. So what we traditionally seeing is supply chain relationships are based on very transactional relationships. So I buy something from my supplier, they provide, and that's about our relationship. We don't really share information. We don't really know what is happening at the supplier side. Suppliers are segmented. They don't know what is happening at their yeah. partners in the supply chain. So by creating a more collaborative environment, we can create a ecosystems of suppliers which are willing to share information, which are willing to plan together, which are willing to um, find solutions together which results in quicker responses mm -hmm. i think the experience that we had about the shortage of toilet rolls and yeast for example i think m many of it comes with a uh, lack of visibility of where the inventory it is yeah. it wasn't that we were producing less of these products it was just we didn't know where the supply where the inventory is and then by the time we realized okay many of these inventories are in hotels, in restaurants, in hospitals, in offices, in, in the places that were all shut down and we didn't need toilet rolls in those places. We needed them in the supermarket shelves. So creating a more collaborative environment brings more visibility also to the supply chain. Okay, Manush, thank you very much for that. That's been very helpful and, and, and insightful in terms of what could be done differently maybe in the future. Uh, I would like to bring Jazz uh, Kalra in now and uh, welcome him to to our virtual panel. And uh, maybe Jazz, like everybody else, maybe you start off by just introducing yourself, what you do at the Bath uh, University of Bath, and and also uh, you know the kind of work you're involved in currently. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Andreas. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, having me here. Really happy to be here. So I'm. Uh, my name is Jas Kalra, and I'm a research fellow at HPC Supply Chain Innovation Lab, which is based at School, University of Bath School of Management. So um, I've been working 
with the supply chain innovation lab for the past three years. Prior to this, I, I earned my PhD in supply chain management from Manchester Business School, and then I, then I came to Bath and, and started this piece of work. So as part of this lab, I work with a large scale um, mega project infrastructure project, which is the Hinkley Point C nuclear power plant. And my specific, my work, my expertise is, is in the area of procurement and supply chain management. So uh, in this particular project, I've been looking at the issue of how a large organization works with a, a, you know, the local and the regional SMEs and what are some of the challenges associated with that and how can some of these uh, SMEs capabilities could be leveraged. So that's my, that's the current, uh, uh, current passion project that I have. Brilliant. Well, I mean, that sounds, that sounds very interesting. I mean, I, I think, was it uh, Margaret Thatcher who described the UK as a nation of shopkeepers, uh, you know, in terms of SMEs, you know, and yes. it's probably... It's probably true that the backbone of the UK economy are SMEs. Um, you know, I, I think back to my time in, in, in banking. I used to be a business banker with Lloyd's TSB, and my, my role was to look after SMEs at that point. But how, how, do, how do large organizations uh, in the UK uh, leverage SMEs to, to do what Manoush started to talk about in terms of diversification, in terms of mm -hmm. having more people on board, in terms of doing things, but, you know, to actually leverage the, the whole ecosystem to be slightly more collaborative, but also more effective. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Andreas. Uh, um, so first of all, I would, I would kind of reinforce what you, what you just said, is that UK is indeed uh, depends. Uh, uh, highly relies on its SME ecosystem. So the current, I mean, if you look at the current state of business in the UK, uh, the number of SMEs in the UK is 5.9 million, which comes to about, well, 99%. So 99% of the UK business is SMEs. Yeah. And out of that 99%, the 96% of businesses is micro SMEs, so less than 10 employees. So essentially, if you are thinking about uh, kind of just just borrowing Manusha's point here about visibility and shortening the lead times and shortening the supply chains. If you are essentially thinking about de doing business in the UK, working with the with the, um, with the suppliers in the UK, that you have to take uh, take this fact into the consideration that you have the ninety nine percent of the organisation you would be speaking to are SMEs. If you're not if you're not taking that into consideration, then you're essentially taking the prosperity away from them and giving them to the established MNCs. And, and um, you know, of course, there are, there are a range of issue, issues uh, associated with that. So these, um, so when you're looking at these SMEs uh, and you're looking at uh, when a large organization starts to think in terms of engaging with SMEs, yeah. one of the biggest problems that it faces is, uh, first of all, is I would like to call it cultural uh, dissonance. So they mm -hmm. think that these SMEs, uh, they can't work with us and we won't be able to work with them. So they, we don't understand each other's culture, which, well, you know, in my research experience, when I've spoken to SMEs, uh, the other day I was speaking to some of the SMEs in the Cumbria region, and they, they say that that's a gross underestimation, that uh, the thing is that we have evolved from a nation of shopkeepers, and the thing is that we have this niche local knowledge, which these, some of these businesses can leverage, uh, and, uh, and we can actually help them. For example, case in point, uh, uh, I really like Manusha's example of that knowing where the inventory is. So it might be in hotels, it might be in the in the shops which are not open anymore. So these regional, these small businesses will have a social capital in the region. So they will they will have relationships and goodwill in the region. So an established organization will take time to develop that social capital, but these SMEs they can basically just make a call and know, do you have those toilet rules roles? You're not using them. Can I have them? I will pay pay uh, you know I'll pay uh, pay for them at a later stage. So this is the SMEs. They have this direct buy-in from the community, and that is something that these large organizations can leverage through these SMEs. So that's just one of the examples. But the idea is that if you're starting to work with SMEs, then uh, you have to think very carefully about what this SME ecosystem is, what are the capabilities in the region, and what are the sums of tools and techniques you can use to kind of engage SMEs into your supply chain. Right. Good. I, I, lo I love the, the sort of interactive nature of the Zoom. I've already been corrected by Phil that actually it wasn't Margaret Thatcher at all who mentioned that we're a nation of shopkeepers. Apparently it was Napoleon. 
But what did he know? <laughs> I think I think I must have referred to uh, Margaret Thatcher. She, I think she was the daughter of a shopkeeper. Maybe I got that wrong. So, mm -hmm. but anyway, uh, I think also in the chat, it's quite clear that I think very few people probably realise that uh, UK business is 99% SME. You know, I think that's that's quite surprising. Certainly surprising to me. I, I knew it was big, but I didn't realise it was that big. And I quite like the idea of actually working more collaboratively between SMEs and big businesses in terms of sort of partnerships in terms, you know, and, and, and sharing of, of expertise. But, but how could it be the other way around? How could large companies develop SME capabilities, you know, in terms of flexibility, mm -hmm. nimbleness, reacting to change, those kind of things? So, uh, and that's definitely a, you know, the other big challenge that these large organizations face and that, you know, well, how to kind of manage the capability gap that exists in the, in the SMEs. So if not the scope of it, then certainly the scale of it. So, uh, I mean, in our research experience, what we have seen is that there are three, uh, there are three steps, if you like, that are, that needs to be taken by these large organizations to start working with SMEs and developing their capabilities over time. And I'll go through uh, each of them uh, one by one. So first of all is finding and engaging the right players. So uh, imagine a large organization coming into a region and choosing to work with SMEs. Uh, they won't know which, who are, who are the right SMEs and what are the capabilities in the region. So they need to engage with uh, local organizations such, such as, you know, chambers of commerce, yeah. leverage them to, to understand who these SMEs are and developing just a uh, web portal where these SMEs can register their interest is not enough. Uh, we have examples of organizations that who are, who have been fairly successful in engaging SMEs is that you have to make them believe you, that you are going to walk the talk and this is not just yeah. Uh, you know, just lip service. So, uh, you know, we've seen senior managers from large organizations going to these ch uh, chambers of commerce, uh, local pubs in the region where they don't have community halls uh, and talking to people that, yes, we, we really want you to be there. And, you know, one of the first questions one of these SMEs, some of these SMEs would have is they don't have the confidence. They sometimes say that, you know, we are not big enough to work with you. But then you have to say, uh, well, if you're a large organization, you have to say, well, we'll we are willing to work with you. And that's where the second, second step comes, which is, which is kind of the, uh, directly addresses your question. So the second step is mapping these capabilities, like understanding exactly where do these capabilities map your requirements, what the gaps are, and then working with SMEs to develop those capabilities. And that's where, you know, the, the major piece of work would uh, would be uh, involved. So, for example, you might find that these SMEs might have very niche, specialized capabilities, right? And yeah. then, uh, for example, uh, you might need a catering supplier, but you might not have an established catering supplier in the region. You might have a butcher, a a dairy, uh, you know, a dairy, a cheese supplier, a a uh, a drink supplier, what you could do is that you can ask them to combine their capabilities, work collaboratively with each other because they are not competitors. They just don't know that there is this model, that there is a big organization that, that can come and give us the incentive to work with each other so they can combine their capabilities and then start putting, uh, start putting the food on the plate. So that's one example. So just right. understanding where the gaps are and kind of leveraging them. And uh, also, um, investing in sort of the training of these SMEs or developing certain time, uh, developing certain, uh, uh, devoting some time to, to enhance collaboration or cooperation, which I think one of our professors uh, spoke to you about, uh, the cooperation, this aspect of cooperation uh, in the face of competition between these, between these organizations. And then the third and the final step, which kind of en encompasses everything, is kind of having a long-term view that yeah this is not going to be done in a day and you have to have a long-term thinking all the successful organizations toyota uh who you just spoke about who kind of uh, brought uh, jit to the world uh they were long-term thinkers so they knew rome won't be built in a day so you need to think that these are even when i go out of this region once my business is done will these organizations that i've formed will they be able to survive so you need to say that they are they are bidding for you, but they are also ready to bid for other contracts. You might need to kind of help train them in the new contracting methods, help them link to the funders. They can get some funding, some small term business loans. And, you know, so as a large organization, you need to kind of think beyond what you need and kind of start thinking more proactively about the region. Okay. 
Just Maybe as- just to, to add to this, uh, what Chess was saying, I think um, very much important to think about local champions internally. Um, so where you have uh, individual managers who maybe grew up in a particular region who are sort of linked to that region and very interested to build it, as well as externally what Chess already said about uh, local councils, local partners, universities even. Um, so I think there are a lot of uh, different individuals and organizations that can help with that and I'm Mm. I'm sure not just Jess, but also Phil will talk a little bit about the, the wider stakeholder network that is needed really to drive that. Yeah, yeah. no, th- thank you for that. If I, if I can just uh, kind of finish up uh, uh, Jens's point and just kind of add a bit more to answer it. So uh, in terms of internal champions, we do have example that, you know, when you are, when you appoint a, someone, a supply chain engagement manager who is invested in the local community, who mm. in some cases might be maybe born and raised in that region, what, who is passionate about bringing prosperity to that community, then he will take that extra ter- step. He will go that extra mile. And also the local organization will see that person as one of their own and will listen to him. And that kind of engages the SMEs as well. No, that sounds very interesting. This, this, could, be a, this could be a much broader concept on, of social corporate responsibility okay. into how companies work amongst themselves, not just uh, with, the, with the, you know, the community itself. So it's interesting. Thank you very much, Jess, for that. That's very, very interesting. We covered both the SME and the, the larger market. And uh, now we get to uh, Phil, and we're going to talk a bit more about sort of regional development and maybe government intervention. So we're going to cover all bases from the smallest to the largest today. Uh, so welcome, Phil. And maybe you can do uh, what the others have done and just say a little bit about uh, uh, something about yourself, what you do at Bath University, and then we get into the questions. Okay, thank you, Andreas, and thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be on the panel. Um, I'm Professor Phil Tomlinson. I'm a Professor of Industrial Strategy at the University of Bath in the School of Management. So I'm afraid I'm not a supply chain expert. Um, My expertise is about industrial strategy and regional development and have a particular interest in in how we can revitalise former, um, old former traditional industries and traditional regions and um, promote inclusive regional growth. Um, I've done some work um, with Swindon Lep on developing their local industrial strategy and um, I currently sit on the um, West of England Combined Authority Skills Advisory Panel as a university member. Okay, well I mean that's that's uh, that's uh, heavyweight involvement so that this should be this should be very interesting. Maybe we can start off by talking about uh, the regional development implications for things like supply chain failures and disruptions. Okay, well, I think as uh, Jazz and others have pointed out, um, supply chains pretty much make up the bulk of the economy. And so what affects the the supply chain obviously has an impact on our national and regional prosperity. So with the COVID pandemic, um, we've had a lockdown. We're only just beginning to ease out of that. And um, we saw in April, for instance, uh, UK GDP fell by an unprecedented 20.4% in April alone. Um, now, unless there's a quick and sustainable recovery, in my book, that's not recession. I'm afraid it's probably depression territory. Yeah. Uh, and this comes on top of uh, a decade when uh, we experienced the, the slowest growth, economic growth in over 60 years. Um, in terms of the lockdown, some sectors, supply chains and regions have been more adv- adversely affected than others. So if I'm looking locally here in the southwest, the, the sector I'm really concerned about um, in the long term, in the medium and long term, is aerospace. Um, the southwest itself is renowned for its expertise and capabilities in advanced engineering, and yeah. much of this revolves around Airbus and its operations in Fil- at Filton. And of course, the aerospace industry is one of the UK's crown jewels. It's a highly innovative industry. It creates, generates high quality jobs, well-paid jobs. And the UK is second only to the US in, the glo- in terms of global market share. But even before the pandemic, the industry was facing significant challenges, especially with the real prospects of a, of a no-deal no deal Brexit looming as well. So it's a very difficult time for the sector. And of course, like many industries, particularly this, it's an industry driven by confidence and, and, and by demand. And demand has gone through the floor. Uh, people aren't flying because of travel restrictions or quarantine restrictions and also because they're very fearful now of catching the, of the virus. And also, as we've got been in lockdown, people are beginning to, to rethink whether they need to fly as much in the future. 
So for instance, for business meetings and, and, and conferences, maybe we can do more of our business via, via Zooms. And this may be the start of a new long-term trend, particularly with concerns about um, the climate change and carbon emissions. So we've seen flights canceled, holidays canceled, and you have further downstream close to the customer. Um, British Airways have cut, cut 12,000 jobs, uh, both Virgin and Ryanair have each cut 3,000 jobs, and many more airlines, particularly smaller regional airlines, not just in the UK, but around Europe and around the world, are, are on the financial brink. And this obviously impacts on the wider supply chain. So further up the supply chain, by chain, Airbus itself in the UK has put 2,200 of its employees on the government's furlough scheme. In addition, other manufacturing sectors have also been adversely set, affected. So if you think about automotive, around a third of UK workers have been furloughed and there are estimates and fears that up to one in six jobs in the sector might be lost. And we all know about the difficulties in the hospitality sector, um, which has been completely shut down around 80% of, of workers are on furlough. I think as we start to ease out of lockdown now, um, we're gonna have some social distancing measures in place, even though they've kind of been gradually been relaxed. But that itself is gonna have a, a negative impact on how we do work, work in the workplace, and it might negatively impact upon productivity, especially in manufacturing. Yeah. And, and of course, there's also consumer confidence. Um, some recent research, even from this week, from EY Consultants, shows that uh, UK consumers are still very, very nervous about returning to the high street and doing things that they used to do before, before lockdown, such as trying on clothes in a, in a shop. They're very nervous about that sort of thing. So many are still fearful of catching the virus if they're, if they're out of that town. And also they're fearful about the, the job situation as well. So they're less likely to, um, to spend money on, 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 normal consumer, uh, on normal consumer products. So this obviously affects consumer demand, and indeed employment prospects. Yeah. Okay. And we're also, we're also is, the furlough yeah. scheme. Um, now that's been going to be eased out a bit. Um, firms are, are going to start thinking twice about whether it is worth carrying on. Now some firms in the supply chain might be able to survive short-term losses, but if they're unable to cover their operating costs, wages, rent, or premises, then many may probably decide to to close so it's a bit of a vicious circle I haven't going on out there and if we get a second wave of the virus a second light lockdown that's a big big problem for us well as you highlighted phil i mean even uh, you know the situation is unprecedented as it is you know mm -hmm. i think the government currently pays a third of all workers in the uk you know that's that that would have been unheard of i i, I can't remember another time when when this was uh, taking place and then you've got the issues in terms of uh, uh, the the sort of lack of demand, as you said, the GDP has decreased by more than 20%. And nobody seems to have confidence that this uh, demand is going to just bounce straight back. You know, they think there's, this is going to be a sort of a long-term thing and uh, it's going to be felt for a long period of time. I mean, the, the other thing then is, is obviously, you know, the government has made all these interventions, nationalised the railways, it's, it's paying more workers, it's helped the businesses, it's done the furlough scheme. I mean... What government role do you see going forward? Well, yeah, you, you, you're right. Um, it, it has had a furlough scheme and it's got these, these, these loan schemes as well. Um, I think the loan schemes themselves have given around 31, made 31 billion pounds of loans available to 750,000 firms so far. Um, and there's also been talk of a, a project Birch where the government might provide direct subsidies or even take financial stakes in struggling firms. And this is what other countries are doing. Um, your own country, Germany, for instance, has taken a stake in Lufthansa, the, the airline company. Yeah. And it has echoes of old style industrial policy. Um, so some of the older listeners uh, may remember Tony Benn's much derided National Enterprise Board in the 1970s, which did take stakes in particular firms. Um, it, it, was, it was very much derided and, and Thatcher closed it down, of course, when she got to power. But um, it did have some successes. For instance, it rescued British Aerospace and Rolls Royce. Um, so um, it's 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 very interesting. I mean, it's got some merit, and I think if government are going to be providing big subsidies to bigger companies, they should be taking an equity stake to ensure the taxpayer doesn't lose out. And it's something we did with the banking sector over a decade ago. But I think just remember, we we don't have much experience of this type of 
or much recent experience this type of industrial intervention or the appropriate institutional setup to decide on which firm should receive subsidies and which shouldn't. And that's important because you may well be supporting firms that were failing or would have failed anyway, irrespective of the pandemic. Yeah. And, then, and there's always a danger of corruption in these sorts of schemes and you may get accusations of government picking winners, um, which has often been, been levied at, uh, at industrial strategy. But if you're looking for some positive policy measures, well, I think central government could work with local government here and pr prioritise and bring forward some shovel-ready projects, possibly to promote green growth and uh, sustainable infrastructure projects. So earlier this week, um, the Policy Exchange Think Tank, which is a centre-right think tank, uh, to be fair, I mean, had a forward by the former Labour Chancellor, Alistair Darling, but they put some interesting um, suggestions out there, such as more electric vehicle charging infrastructure should be brought forward. Um, maybe enhanced gigabyte capable broadband, uh, particularly in rural areas. RNZ investments in hydrogen technologies and health related infrastructure in things such as green walking, cycling routes, improved public parks, leisure and swimming facilities. And many of these can be devolved um, to local authorities. Um, if you look at the pandemic um, and the response to the pandemic, much has been managed at the regional level um, in, in terms of healthcare provision and education provision. Um, and the West Coming Combined Authority, like other regions, has, have established a regional task force um, to revive the economy. But there are many challenges in this because uh, we've just had a decade of austerity. Um, local government over the last decade has had real terms reductions in 49% in local government funding. And even dealing with the pandemic itself, um, many regional mayors are warning that many of the biggest cities are going to go bankrupt. Manchester has a financial shortfall of around £732 million. Locally, Baines are worried about a, a £40 to £50 million shortfall in commercial revenue. But things like lost business rates, um, lost council tax or defaults on council tax and, and lost tourist income. Um, so these are big concerns for the local government. You know, so if they're going to play a part in the, in the, uh, in the recovery, there's got to be a new fiscal set settlement um, for, for, for local governments as well. So these are, these are big issues. And these issues are, are not just in the short term. I mean, you know, yeah. you, do you get a sense that actually, you know, the, the lockdown over the last 12, 14 weeks is only just the start of the, the issues around supply chains and, and, uh, and the economic performance going forward? Definitely. Um, you know, um, I mean, it's coming at a time when obviously we've had Brexit. Uh, we're trying to negotiate a new trade deal. Um, and at the same time, um, combined authorities in conjunction with the local economic partnerships, the LEPs, have been starting to roll out local industrial strategies, um, which is their plans to try and revitalize their local region over the next five to 10 years. Um, and much of this focus is revolved around um, skills policy yeah. uh, and, and, and how we get the skills for revitalizing the economy going forward. Um, and we've all, all of a sudden we've had the pandemic and we've had, some of the issues have become particularly acute. So um, obviously we've had schools have shut down, colleges shut down, um, and WECA have had to sort of had an immediate problem, for instance, about... Um, addressing vulnerable groups and those missing out on schooling, particularly in deprived areas. Um, some schools, of course, have tried to provide lessons digi digitally, um, but we know digital provision and connectivity is patchy. There are real digital divides across the region. Um, and we have big concerns about a lost generation here with school leavers, uh, college and university graduates, and a, and a possible increase in the so-called needs, those not in education, employment and training and that will, will feed into the supply chain as, uh, as as well so i mean so I, I'm, I'm sorry to find a bit dismal i mean there are some positive things which have um, happened we started to rethink how we might uh yeah. um organize our working environment um and some sectors themselves even locally have been more resilient so if you think about hinkley point HVSPC, that's, that's effectively a state-backed project. Yeah. Um, there'll be some temporary disruption there to, in the construction of that project and construction of that power station, and, and Yenis could probably tell us a bit more to that. But 
that shall go that will go ahead in the in the medium to long term and that's kind of a natural buffer to the shock we're facing um also in the southwest we have some good strengths in healthcare provision and medical equipment we you know it's one of our strengths in the region and given the issues about sourcing personal protective equipment I'm expecting the UK to have a long conversation about reshoring some of the medical supply chain going forward. And that might be a great opportunity for some of our firms in the, in the Southwest. And you may make similar arguments around food security as well, particularly with Brexit on the horizon. And we have a relatively strong agri-tech sector in the Southwest, which could benefit. And also locally here, um, just at the Bristol the Mass Science Park, we have the IAP project going ahead, which is the, the new automo automotive propulsion systems um, facility going on the, on the um, science park involving the university. And that should um, link in with the regions of advanced engineering capabilities. Yep. So there may be opportunities around developing low carbon technologies, particularly around electrical vehicles. Now, if we're worried about aerospace, for instance, and we're worried about a lot of our firms in the supply chain in aerospace, and we're worried about the vulnerability of those firms in aerospace, we might need to be looking at supporting some of those firms to probably think about adapting and reorientating to other opportunities in adjacent sectors. So that might be an opportunity there with IAPS um, in, in the medium to longer term. Okay, well, thank you, Phil. That's that's been really interesting, and particularly in terms of the regional dimension here and the gov and the size of government intervention that might be needed to actually shore up uh, the industry going forward. I, I know you've thrown the B word at me several times there. Uh, I want I want to ask you another question about that. I'm sure that will come out in uh, the Q and A session. So I would like to thank you all very much indeed, uh, Jens, uh, Manoush, Jazz, and Phil. Uh, for an excellent panel uh, that's been really helpful and I'm, I'm sure I'm looking at the chat there's people are sort of chatting with me privately I'm sure they may want to also ask a question publicly so anybody who doesn't mind being videoed if you want to uh, now put the video camera on and unmute yourself and we go to the uh, Q&A session just give people a, a few minutes Duncan is there, yes, with his PPE on. Duncan, do you want to start us off with, with other people still coming on board? Do you want to ask a question? Yes. Sorry about the PPE. I had, I had somebody here with me earlier. Yeah. Um, basically, um, if you look at the problem that supply chains seem to be facing in the post-COVID world, then surely we need to be asking about what the question of ownership is. Because cooperative structures and I'm a member of the cooperative party by the way are ideally suited to maintaining resilient supply chains I mean I think you've done your own research on this Phil um, on the idea of horizontal and vertical sorry, vertical and horizontal um, structures they maximize traceability for example and we're going to have to face the problem because of the problem of increasing um, in food and the resistance of antibiotics it can minimize fraud proper profit sharing maximizes trust between different bodies we've left the farm to fork cooperative supply chain of the EEC so that was that was moving towards quite a powerful cooperative chain of suppliers what now is there to be able to develop the moral value of cooperatives uh, in this, what I think I suspect, panic to come. Okay, I, I think, uh, Duncan, are you addressing this to Phil or any, anybody in particular? I refer to Phil's research, but I'd like all three to answer it if they could. Okay, gentlemen and lady, whoever wants to go first, please. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take sort of the supply chain perspective. Um, I completely agree. I think whatever the future model will look like, I mean, there needs to be more visibility with regards to who's in the supply chain, who's doing what, who owns what. And I think there needs to be also a move away generally from the uh, 
discussion to say that critical items are normally the items that are most expensive. I think they are, I think as we have seen in the last few months, not necessarily the most expensive items or the most critical ones. So um, some of the healthcare equipment, some of the PPEs, obviously products which are worth a few pennies, but obviously um, highly crucial, highly critical. So I think similar to other countries, I know Germany is talking about this and so is the UK. I think there needs to be discussion what should be reshored and what should we bring back, I guess, um, to a certain degree. And I think also maybe echoing what uh, Phil said, so some of the uh, capabilities that we have in the Southwest, I think there are some of the capabilities that could be moved um, to very good use, uh, maybe cutting across other sectors as well. Um, so yeah, maybe, I don't know, Phil, if you want to, pick up on the on this discussion yeah i think we are seeing a move a gradual move over the last few years to to um to reshoring um i know in particular i'm talking about the ceramics industry in particular because i've done some work on the ceramics industry we've seen a lot of ceramics firms actually getting a um a bit of annoyed about their about the quality of their supply chains in in, in the far east and, and the logistics around distribution and so they've started to reshore um uh, some of the, some of their manufacturing back back into um, into North Staffordshire, um, and also you know we, the old model you know the model that was put, you know put forward in the nineteen nineties early two thousands was that um, what you need to do is you need to maximise your comparative advantage or your competitive advantage and you and you, um, you did your innovation and R and D here in the in the UK that's what we're great at and you out sourced um, your manufacturing to lower cost locations around the globe in, in global supply chains. Um, increasingly, we're now seeing there are close links between innovation, manufacturing and, and R&D. And uh, this distance is problematic for, for innovation. And I think uh, we're increasingly seeing manufacturers and businesses seeing that uh, as well. And, and I think policymakers are now you know, obviously, it's been forced onto them with the uh, with the problems we've had in in, in some supply chain disruptions with the, the pandemic, and I think it will be um, even more apparent when we when we come to to the note if we come to a no deal Brexit uh, in the new year. Um, so we're going to I think we're going to be really thinking about you know how can we build rebuild capability to be honest in in, in some cases in in the UK to um, perhaps manufacture. Or bring some of these supply chains closer to home. I think that's the. I think that's the um, where the trend is going. Okay. Well, thank uh, you very much. Just, uh, just kind of just adding to that one point uh, about so the capabilities that have been lost over the years um, due to outsourcing. What 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 happens is that when you're outsourcing over over a period of ten or so years, the skills and capabilities they also go out of the country or at, at least out of your organization, even if you're outsourcing at the same country. Now, building those capabilities back is not easy because so many years have passed and also the mobilization of capabilities is, is not, is not a, a simple process. So you need to replicate individuals, their interactions and the macro social structures. So for, for instance, in 1990s, when we, uh, when we all thought that we can just bring Toyota's JIT back in the UK and US, uh, it, it, we haven't quite uh, replicated that here because we are not able to replicate this, the structure, the way of life or, or, or the philosophy behind the lean. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, a really good point about if now that we're talking about reshoring and bringing the capabilities back, uh, it kind of goes back to the point that we, we discussed that it has to have a long-term thinking and we should be ready for smaller short-term to medium-term failures as well and not be deterred by it. Okay. Okay, Duncan, does that answer your question? Yeah, but uh, nobody mentioned cooperatives, but I do understand the spirit of cooperative was behind the answers. Could Manoush talk something about cooperatives and their role in Turkish supply chains? Yes, I, I think I can add just to what my colleague said. On the, because I think what Duncan was saying was more to do creating a more incentive, cooperative incentives for companies to, uh, to come together and start collaborating across the whole supply chains. So we were, we are seeing more of a partnership. So the, all these new innovation and R and D developments that we are seeing in the supply chains are now, um, 
structured in a way that it's uh, it, there is a shared ownership. So in supply chain, rather than I'm buying from you, so no one, so as a buyer, I pay you for a service. So it becomes more of a shared ownership. So I'm I'm sharing a lot. I'm sharing losses losses with my suppliers. I'm sharing costs. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Which in a way we have a long stream of reach, research that uh, evidently shows that it can, it can increase trust, it can increase cooperative behaviors, it can increase knowledge sharing because everyone sees benefits in contributing to that share pot and also they see they all damage the losses equally if there is any shortcoming in the supply chain. So I think the structure of the incentives in the supply chain can also drive these cooperative behaviors. Okay. Maybe just 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 to add to this, I think the, the government, the UK government obviously plays a big role as well with regards to setting the right incentives. So we have seen that um looking at the range of UK infrastructure project and the drive or the need and the responsibility by the government to set certain parameters um, to drive not just private value, so the value that you create or economic value for the organization, but also driving um, value that is being created for the for the wider good, social, public value. So I think there's a, there's a lot that can be done, uh, not just within the organization or with regards to multiple organizations coming together or members of an organization, but I think also the wider policy space to start thinking about setting the the right framework for that and I think we will probably see more of that um, with regards to Brexit I guess and the and money flowing into sort of larger infrastructure projects and some of the public and social value that needs to be created with those kind of large scale projects as well. Okay well that's great I think that's all. Uh, Thank you yeah. It was a nice question to actually pull together the various strands around collaboration, SMEs working together, supply chains, local rather than international, etc. I've got another question, hand up, and it's been very patient. Yazin's iPhone. It tells me you've got a question. You, I know. You don't hello, share. hello, everybody. Uh, sorry, my uh, my cam is not uh, is problematic with my iPhone. Uh, so apologies for that. Normally, I open my camera. Hello, everybody, and I think this has been a fascinating event for me coming uh, outside of the field of supply chain management. But I was in the field back in the years, so I really liked and enjoyed and learned a lot from the discussions. Uh, just a very naive question. Uh, think about, for example, an SME that's just established during the COVID time. Uh, and I was wondering your top tips of how this small SME can integrate an element of resilience in their uh, supply chain relationships when it was not established. So that, that's a small SME, let's say. It's a hypothetical situation, but that's very I'm very curious about it. How can a small SME, let's say, of 50 people who, or which exports, uh, which imports and exports uh, coffee beans in a local city like Bath, how can that SME actually integrate the element of resilience into their supply chain? But before that relationship, before those relationships have actually been established, uh, in a physical and face-to-face -face and in a trust, in a mutually trusting manner. Uh, so I was wondering about your top tips of how a small SME can actually achieve that resilience in establishing their supply chains when they cannot see their suppliers face-to-face. -face. I suppose who wants to take that? I mean, Jazz, you talked about SMEs, but uh, do you want to give that a first go and then uh, we'll pass it on to somebody else? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Happy to uh, kind of give my give my perspective on it. Uh, uh, of course. Um, so, um, if you if you uh, imagine, well, have a hypothetical SME which has been set up during this COVID times. Exactly. And, uh, exactly. Let's say, uh, yeah, a coffee. So, um, an an SME that has been just established, among, let's say, uh, twenty five, fifty individuals, they would essentially would have to first. So they they will have their niche capability. So I think. Uh, Okay, so I'll, I'll start from the from the other uh, other strand. So first of all, what they have, what is their capability? So the capability at that time is is the human capital. So uh, the knowledge that they have, uh, the forty to fifty people that they have, they have to kind of understand that this is this is their starting point. They don't have uh, a supply chain that they can work with, and. Um, or, or they are still looking for, let's say, uh, or they, they are forming relationships that are very embryonic in the region. The second thing would be to 
almost take a, a slightly radical approach, which would be, uh, which kind of the research suggests in the broader sociological uh, literature, is that rather than trying to form business relationships at the, at the beginning, try to form social capital in the community. Because once you're an SME, you have this uh, by in, in, your, in your region, people, people realize that you are one of their own. So kind of doing some of the work, which, is, which, you, which might not actually make economic sense, like, for example, doing some, uh, inv getting involved in some of the local charities, uh, doing some of the volunteer work. Now that might ca come at the expense of short-term losses, but that will actually start building your social capital in, in the region, which will kind of position yourself in a, in a slightly preferred position than some of the established, established organizations in the region. Now, once you start developing the social capital in the community, that will start kind of translating into the economic uh, side of the social capital, which is kind of your ties translating into the goodwill that you're developing into into the community, and that might lead to business relationships. So what I'm what I'm kind of trying to conclude is that uh, we know that the research tells us that human capital, which is the knowledge embedded inside your firm, needs to be integrated with the social capital. Which in this case, I would not. Uh, I would start with the more Putnam's kind of uh, uh, sorry, Robert Putnam's uh, sort of the public. Uh, community social capital, you leverage that and then start translating into the more instrumental economic social capital, which is more of the James Coleman's view. So uh, in sum, start with the knowledge, build community relationship, do some of the, some of the short term sacrifices might be in order. And then uh, that would lead to your business relationship, which might kind of contribute to your resilience over time in, in that uh, setting. So that's fine. Well, presumably you also have got things like business clubs, enterprise schemes, uh, rotary clubs, uh, even the BRSI is not a bad place to come and mingle with, uh, with budding entrepreneurs. And uh, so this is, you know, isn't this much more, as you described, Jess, it's, it's about sort of integrating yourself in the local business community and, and finding official or unofficial links, how to, how to actually uh, integrate with that and, and collaborate with other people and get their opinions and, and, and establishing yourself that way. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, I guess it links back to the discussion earlier about local champions as well. So um, I think what, one, one other thing to say, I completely agree with what uh, Chess is saying about building relationships, but again, quite often that will take months, if not years really to establish. I mean, one of the other things, I guess, for local SMEs um, being set up at a very difficult time is to standardize. So not being too fancy and trying to have a, a whole range of different products, but maybe start off with, with, with a, a smaller range of products and then over time successively then build up your, your different range of uh, products and thinking about probably multiple suppliers as well. So again, um, I think Manoush did briefly talk about this. So having suppliers um, at different areas or different region in the world and um, to source different uh, products from as well. I think that's uh, very important as well. Okay. Jasin, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, they were very interesting. Thank you, uh, Jan Sanjas. Thank you so much. These are very interesting, actually. Yeah, it was a pleasure to listen to you. Good, good. Now, I have a question, but before I ask my question, is there anybody else on the, on the call, on the Zoom call now, who wants to ask another question? Well, I'll leave you to contemplate and cogitate over that, and I'll ask my question. I'll probably direct it first uh, of all to Phil, and it relates to the big bad B word again. And uh, so given, given the economic situation, which isn't uh, unique to the UK, lots of countries are suffering economically and will be suffering economically. This is probably a global thing, a global pandemic and... Uh, it's a, it's a global economic uh, issue. Um, but what impact will Brexit have, either for positively or negatively, uh, at this time for the UK economy? And uh, w what will be different under Brexit rather than staying within the EU? Well, that's a big <laughs> question. I mean, all the analysis, as, um, all the analysis sees a negative impact. And... Uh, I think the national analysis, depending on the type of deal that is agreed, I mean, I think it's quite clear now that, uh, that the, the government is, is putting its foot down that it's going to go for a no deal, um, which may, takes us pretty much on WTO rules, um, which actually makes the UK a, a rule taker in world trade. Um, 
Yeah, our major export market is is um, is Europe. About forty five percent of our exports go to Europe. Um, and if we lo lose um, seamless trade with Europe, that's a big impact on regional supply chains in the UK and and, and manufacturers. And the irony is, all the analysis that, sh is, that have been done shows that those areas that are that predominantly rated leave are going to be worse hit because they're more dependent upon on on trade with with Europe because their their eco regional economies the West Midlands in particular northeast uh, of England and in the northwest as, as well um, are more dependent upon manufacturing um, so if you you know if we go to no deal brexit um, I think there's there's eight billion pounds of short positions on a no deal brexit a lot of hedge fund managers have got short positions because they want the pound to fall so they can make a, quite a bit of money on that. Um, so uh, that, that's where it's heading. But if you have a no deal Brexit, then all of a sudden um, we lose seamless trade with Europe. There will be tariffs and um, checks on goods. Um, there'll be delays at ports. Um, even, even if the UK says unilaterally says we're not going to have a, any checks initially uh, on any goods coming from Europe, Trade is circular. If a truck comes over from um, from Calais to Dover, um, it's got to deliver its uh, its supplies into the UK. It has to go back, so there's going to be delays. Um, there's more paperwork for business. Um, it, it's massive costs on 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 business, and and I think that's um, the the estimates are, as I say, about you know over the next decade or so, about an eight percent loss in GDP for the UK. So it all depends on the deal. I mean, usually trade deals take several years to um, negotiate, and we're hoping to do one in a few weeks. I just don't see any any rationale for that. Um, it would make sense, given we're all suffering, we're in, in this pandemic, that the world economy has slowed down at the moment, um, for us to take our time. If you look at history, um, you look at the 1920s and 1930s in particular, um, and the Great Depression, we didn't have the right policy responses. Countries looked inward, they were protectionist, and we had, you know, it, it wasn't a nice outcome at the end of the day. Um, I, I, so I do fear, um, you know, I'm not, you know, the no deal Brexit, I think it's very much on the cards, and it's, it's grossly irresponsible for the government to pursue it. No, that's, 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 thank you for the answer. I mean, I suppose from my point of view, uh, this would play out very differently if a country had a different manufacturing and industrial base. Well, possibly. Uh, I mean, it's going to impact upon Europe as well, but um, they have been reorientated. They're more prepared for it than, than, than or were more prepared for it than we are. Um, but, you know, our our share of, of exports, forty five percent of exports go to the you know go to the um, EU. Um, it, it's much less on the other side. It's it's about seven percent I think come, of EU exports come to the UK. So the, the the odds are on their on their favour. Also services, we are pretty much a um, a, um, a service nation now. Um, uh, financial services a big earner for the UK, um, and also insurance services and and and. The like. And a lot of these services are now tied with manufacturing as well. If they don't have easy access to, to European markets, that's going to have a big impact and a knock-on impact as well. Okay. Well, thank you for that. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, I don't think there's any more questions. Uh, oh, no. You have another question. That's great. Um, or are you just wiping your... No, I'm not sure is the thing has gone off. Yes. You're showing the thumbs up. Do you want to ask a question, iPhone? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. It's Peter Winderbank here. Yeah, right. um, sorry about that. I'm doing this on my iPhone and I'm not used to driving it. Um, I, I don't know if this is a blue sky question or not, but, you know, we've heard a lot in the last couple of years about the, the great availability of big data and, you know, that every transaction is recorded. And, and presumably that would have happened in the very sophisticated supply chains. Um, we've also seen a, a sort of, I suppose, a collective um, lack of any knowledge or intuition about what would happen with things like social distancing and when the government, you know, 
and when governments all around the world put in these measures that nobody's done before, is, is anything going to, anything exciting going to come into supply chains from being able to interrogate people's, you know, billions and billions of transactions, um, you know, using complex algorithms or whatever, and then feed that back into supply chains? Interesting question. Who wants to take that? Sorry. Yeah, happy happy to uh, try to address it. I guess. Uh, I mean, there are there are obviously uh, a range of different technologies out there uh, which are more or less being trialed rather than uh, I think properly used. Um, I, I think the big issue again is uh, a, a lot of the technology, including obviously big data, is quite often um, centered within an organization rather than cut across the whole tier one, tier two, tier three. So cutting across the whole supply chain and supply network, which uh, is a big issue. So again, I don't think there will be a quick fix solution in that sense. So it will it will take time to think about um, the data that is being collected. So who's responsible for it? What do we do with the data? Um, um, quite often, and again, we have seen that in our own research, uh, companies are good in collecting data, but they don't necessarily know what to do with it, um, or who is responsible for it, and, and, and what are ultimately uh, what, what do you do with the data and ultimately to inform certain decision making? Um, so I still think that is a, uh, a, a few years um, to go, I think, before that will be uh, properly installed, I guess, and before um, supply chain is probably using all, all the big data that is, um, that is being collected, but not necessarily always uh, enacted, I guess, or acted on you. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I used to work, uh, you know, I used to be a, a consultant in my, my day job and uh, I used to do work with Tesco and, uh, and the Tesco club card, you know, which is, and, and which is based on obviously customer data algorithms in terms of uh, future demand and things like that. And, uh, uh, you know, how nimble they were to feed that back to, to their suppliers was quite interesting. But I, as, as Jens is saying, I don't think that is necessarily something that is fully integrated. You know, it's 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 much more the front end in terms of evaluating customer demand. But even I, I would have thought I, I couldn't think right now of any algorithm in the world that would have predicted the pandemic and done and being able to accurately assess the run on toilet paper or on, <laughs> or on sanitizing gel, etc. It's uh, I think it, there is something interesting in your question, though, because uh, clearly, clearly the, I, the use of artificial data, artificial intelligence, and algorithms to predict those kind of things uh, might be interesting in the future in terms of at least modeling it across the supply chain. I think just to follow up on that, I have this. So it goes back to what uh, Don can also point out was there is one thing having a data and collecting the data yeah. and there's other things sharing the data with suppliers which might not be the really your competitors but you have a feeling they are your competitors so people are or firms are in general protective of what they have and whether they are willing to share it across the supply chain that's the uh, there are issues about the trust and cooperations and all the collaborative behavior so i think having data is one thing yeah. Now, utilizing another thing and also then sharing it is a very different issue. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess the magic circle would be if you could get all this local knowledge that's embedded on SMEs and they're seeing new behaviours that are you know happening in a, a local microcosm, and then writing an algorithm that um, you know interrogates that across the entire country and then the EU or whatever. But just a thought, you know. Well, interesting. I mean, I think I think the whole idea of uh, AI and artificial intelligence and algorithms in terms of pre predicting uh, things in supply chains is quite an interesting topic, I suppose. But again, it's only as good as the sharing, well, the creation of the data and then the sharing of the data, as Manoush uh, quite rightly pointed out. Uh, are there any more questions? There's a few things going on in the chat room, uh, but do people actually want to ask another questions or shall we draw... Uh, tonight's proceedings to an end. No more? Okay, well, I'll, uh, and I assume that uh, nobody else has got uh, any questions. But maybe, maybe we can all unmute ourselves and just uh, say a big, big thank you in the usual way by a big clap for, for Jens, uh, Manoush, Jazz and uh, Phil. Thank you very much, guys. And thank you very much. Thanks,
Great job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very yeah. interesting. Good. Yes, yeah, thank you so much for hosting, obviously, Andreas. And uh, well, thank you so much to the whole audience, I guess, to, to joining yeah. us on a, on a very sunny day. So, yeah. Yes, although the sun, is, the sun has left us now. It's a good yeah. time to finish this particular conversation. But uh, now, thank you very much for partaking, uh, all of you in the panel. It's been really, really interesting. And thank you to you, the audience, uh, as always. As uh, my, you know, if you want to provide any feedback to me, uh, you can get my email address on the on the business and economics page of the BRSI. It's Andreas dot as you see on the screen followed by at brlsi.org. So any feedback anybody has, please send it to me. It's andreas.basmood at brlsi.org.